Okay, okay we are all here. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Wallace, Good morning. Mr. Garcia. How are you today? Good. Good morning, Your Honor. Thank you. Great. You? Okay, uh, Mr. Wallace, you are up. Do you want some rebuttal time? Yes, Your Honor. I would like five minutes for rebuttal. That'll be fine. Thank you. Hey, police court. My name is David Wallace. I'm from the Bentley Keeson, Goodrich and Keeson Law Firm here in Sarasota, here behind, on behalf of the appellants, the Gladdings. Um, as I said, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Um, the key issue in this case is a good faith determination in the context of uh, proposals for settlement. Uh, the standard of review with regard to this is, is abuse of discretion, and we contend that the trial court abused its discretion in, uh, in making a determination that the proposals were not made in good faith. Mr. Wallace, uh, could you, I, I got a little confused as I was reading the materials. The only proposal that the judge reviewed was the what I'll call the 2015 case. Is that correct? That's correct, Your Honor. There are several points of possible confusion, and I apologize if we didn't make it clear. There were okay, but but and and your your clients were not parties to the 15 case. That is correct, Your Honor. The, so the why do they have a dog in this fight? Um, Your Honor, the Gladdings were um, the, there were two cases, Your Honor. There's a 2015 case and a 2019 case. Right. Uh, both cases related to the same agreement. Different causes of action against Joanne DeRosiers, the mom, in the in the 2015 case, and then other causes of action against uh, the Gladdings in the 2019 case. The two cases were consolidated, then tried together, subject of a single final judgment, subject of a single um, appeal before this court that was. Um, uh, resolved in our favor some months ago, um, and 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 more to the point, the proposals them, themselves included as a non-monetary condition the dismissal. Well, I understand the, that's. Let me interrupt you a moment, Mr. Wallace. Excuse yes, me. sir. The 2019 offer had the provision that there'd be a release of your clients. The, the uh, well, there were two sets of proposals, Your Honor. Yeah, um, but the only one that the trial judge considered is the 2015. And he considered an offer in the 2015 case, correct, Your Honor? So I, I'm I'm still a little concerned as to your client's standing and in the his ruling as it relates to the 2015 offer. Well, yeah, and in, in, indeed, I'm sure you're going to hear about that from Mr. Garcia. They've challenged our standing in this in this appeal. Um, our our point is that the Gladdings had an interest in the proposals as they were made, which was uh, that that um, the proposals would have dismissed the 2019 case. It was a non-monetary condition of the proposals that the um, 2019 case be dismissed. Um, so the Gladdings had an interest in the proposals as they were made, and I think as an interest an interest in enforcing the proposals because uh, proposals are enforced as sanctions. Um, well, your, in, your 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 argument is based in part, as I understand it, that the Gladdings were beneficiaries of the other offer. Yes, well, they were beneficiaries of the offers that were that were that were here about. Well, offers are not contracts. Offers are an invitation understood contract but they would they would have been beneficiaries of, of those proposals and, and 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 as as such had an interest in enforcing those proposals and well, they were and never they, accepted so I don't know how they're a contractual beneficiary of anything well it's not just a third party beneficiary theory we did it we did contend that but that's not the entire thing um the, you know and from the from the get-go, um, they were integrally really related in the in the proposals themselves. The 20, uh, 20 proposals that were considered by the court that are the ones we're here about today, in that they would have dismissed the, the claims that relate to them. Well, the, the problem I'm having is to the to the extent you argue that they would have been beneficiaries of whatever the 2019 offer, 
the fact remains the judge did not rule on that or consider that one. And I think we're, I think we are kind of, there, there's some, some dates and some references I want to clear up then, Your Honor. Yep. And we have the 20, 2015 case and the 2019 case. There were, then there were two sets, those, those cases were consolidated. Right. There were two sets of proposals that were made. Um, the, the, the appeal is solely about the 2020 proposals um, that, that were the proposals that included dismissing the Gladdings, the claims against the Gladdings in the 2019 case. So um, I hope that makes it more clear and not less clear, but that's, that's, that, that, that's the state of affairs with the facts. That, that helps me. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. All right. Wallace? Um, yes. Mr. Wallace, let me, let me interrupt. I know you want to probably go into your next point, but um, I, I have a question. As, as far as the order here denying the motion for fees, how is your client how are they adversely affected by that order? Well, I think conceptually, Your Honor, the, the, a, a party that has an interest in a proposal has an interest in it seeing, seeing but, that but, it's enforced. Yeah, but that's an argument that they're adversely affected by the fact that the offerees didn't accept the proposal for settlement. But we're on appeal here from the order and your clients have appealed the order. And so I'm trying to figure out how are they adversely affected by the denial of fees on a proposal that was made by Joan DeRocher? Understood. And, and, and give your honor, a couple of comments. One is that we did, um, we did seek to reclassify Joanne as a who was nominally a, an, an appellee, we did seek to have her reclassified as an appellant and do an amended notice of appeal. That request was denied. Um, uh, but, but also to that point, Your Honor, the final judgment on the merits in the underlying case make a number of findings about the intertwined financial nature of the, um, between Joanne and the Gladdings. In fact, uh, the basis of the court's ruling on the good faith issue that we'll get to in a minute um, was that Joanne's finances had been a, a, a great deal of Joanne's uh, uh, assets had been turned over to the Gladys. Um And then so that's the basis of the, of the trial court's ruling. So they had intertwined finances as found by the trial court. So there is, there is some factual basis for it as well in the final judgment. And, okay, and then you raised a good point on, con I mean, I think you're going to the fact that, the mere fact that these are consolidated, there's some intertwining of factual issues, but how do we get around um, the one case, the one beacon versus Delta Fire that talks about that the parties maintain their separate identities, um, any, and then it doesn't affect the sub substantive rights of the party. So how, how do you get around that? Well, I mean, I, I acknowledge that that in a in a technical sense, these are still two separate cases, and that and that issue kind of cuts both ways in different ways on some of the other issues that might be coming up in this argument. Um, however, um, uh, the, the the bridge, I guess, for for their the Gladding's involvement in these particular proposals is that they were part of the proposals. They were it would have extend it would have extinguished the claims against the Gladding's um, in the 2019 case. And if I may, Judge, if I may, Mr. Wallace, I guess I share. Uh, Judge Smith actually asked this very same question that I was about to ask you, and I'm still help me out. And I, I think, and as you know, Mr. Wallace, I was involved in the panel decision below that basically affirmed, you know, the the, yes. the decision. The, the trip to Morehead. Yeah, correct. But <laughs> but here now we're in a different posture. Joanne is not a party to this case. She's not an appellant in this case. Who appeals are these two individuals that I know you're claiming they become like third party beneficiary. And so I'm still having a hard time with their standing in terms of, and I think what Judge Smith said, you have to be adversely affected. And by them wanting to be, dismiss to be dismissed, they get a benefit from that. There's no 
adversary, you know, for them being adversary affected. And I'm still having difficulty with that. Well, I think there was a desire for, um, you know, the, the, what, what's adverse or what's not uh, might look different at different points in time. Now that we know that we won the trial and, and came out on this side um, through the appeal, that's one thing. But at the time, everybody wanted those proposals. The proposals were made with an intent to settle the case, um, including the 2019 case. So, um, so it, the, 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 at the time, the, the good thing that was intended was, was for the proposals to be ex accepted and for the cases to be settled uh, by acceptance of the proposals prior to trial. And as you know, one of the proposals, not one that's subject to this appeal, but one was accepted and that did result, was reduced to a judgment and, and resulted in a settlement as to Jacqueline, one of the, one of the siblings. Um, Which then I want you to give the, I know the good faith here, we peppered you with these other issues, but with good faith. And I think you just responded by virtue of the fact of this other settlement that was accepted. Doesn't that kind of almost buttress or support the, the trial court's position that Joanne did not have the ability or by when she made the offer, it was not genuine. She'd had no intention to follow through with that by virtue of the fact that this other sibling who accepted her offer has yet to be paid for that. How do you respond to that, Mr. Wallace? Right. I think the, 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 your, that's the heart of the good faith question, Your Honor. And I think the question is whether that's a valid consideration under Florida law or not, whether the offeror's ability to pay is or is not a valid consideration under Florida law. And our contention is that it is not. Um, and, that, and that the cases that have come out over the last 20 years, including uh, Wagner, and I guess it's Don Donahue um, from this court, make it very clear that the good faith analysis is to be, <coughs> bless you, Thank you. It is to be determined. Um, I think the the the, the court in, in 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 the Wagner case said entirely based on um, the the reasonable. I'm going to get to the Wagner case just just for a moment. You know, the reasonable foundation. Um, uh, Wagner reversed this court reversed in Wagner because um, because the lower court had used factors and considerations that were not entirely tied to whether or not there was a reasonable foundation and intent to settle. Um, and so here, um, the trial judge, uh, Judge Hayward, to his credit, was very clear when he made his ruling that he conceded he was not basing his decision on, on the typical considerations and that he was instead kind of going outside the box a little bit. I think the phrase he used is a more expansive application of good faith principles than in the typical analysis. And I think he even referred to the Wagner case, this court's Wagner case, as one in which there was a typical um, the, a typical type of analysis. Uh, so, um, so we get to the point where um, is, is, the, is the ability to pay a valid consideration or not? And, and the case law describes that the reasonable foundation is the relationship between the merits, if you will, of the case and the amount that was offered. Um, and, 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 and that wasn't, the trial judge didn't really even consider that, you know, for the, for our purposes here, the offers were substantial. The three that we're talking about are total more than around 1.5 million. So those were substantial uh, offers. Um, is, and then is, the question uh, of intent to settle, moment? which is, Mr. Wallace, is it of any moment that uh, the offeror had divested herself of all or virtually all of her assets before the offer was made? I, I missed the first part of your question, Your Honor. Is it is it of any moment that the offeror divested herself of her assets before making the offer? And our contention is that that goes directly to this question of ability to pay. And our, our contention is that no, it's not relevant. That ability to pay is not relevant. So it's um, just the relationship of the offer to, I guess, the potential exposure, et cetera. Exactly. And, 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 um, and the intent to settle. And, and the intent to settle, 
Uh, going back to Judge Kazam's question, which is, does the fact that she didn't have the money in the bank mean she didn't intend to settle? Well, I think there are a number of cases out there um, that make clear the Economides case out of this court um, that that what happens if you don't pay, if you don't, if you make, if an offer is accepted and you don't pay up, what happens is there's a process. It gets reduced to a judgment, and and there is a settlement through that mechanism. That's what happened with Jackal. Well, it's not so, a settlement. It's really a, the entry of a judgment in default of a proposed settlement. It, the end of litigation, then, Your Honor. Yes, I, understand, I understand your point. The, with the goal of being to, to, to end the litigation before it goes to trial, those that 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 happened with Jacqueline, and it was an intent to to resolve the case in that way. Um, you know, in our um, in our papers, we we referred to to Pandora's box, which which I think does apply um, in the sen in this sense that if an offeror's ability to pay is a valid consideration in, in looking back at an offer, uh, then why wouldn't it, and if this court validates that as a valid consideration in either the reasonable foundation or intent to settle element, um, then why wouldn't um, litigants in, in every case but, but Mr. Wallace, and I guess maybe you misunderstand me. It's not the fact that she did not have the ability to pay. The question becomes that at the time she made the offer, at the time, did she have every intent to settle? And that's the issue. And if she wanted to settle by saying, I want to settle and resolve this case, and because I want to settle it, I am prepared to offer X amount. And so the question becomes, is it really genuine if she doesn't have that? She has no intention on, 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 on settling it because she cannot, it's an impossibility for her to comply with that. So it's not a matter of oh, opening up somebody's finances and whatever. I think the issue is at the time her offer was made, was she, did she was she intending on settling? Did she have all the things available to settle the case? And 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 I know it's kind of like a, <laughs> it, 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 it's it, it's it's really intertwined. But that's a key. And as I understand what the court did below, they said it basically made an analysis that it really was not. It was you used the word good faith, but she had no intention to settle this case because she had not. She did not have the ability to carry out. The terms of the offer that she made. Does that right? Make sense? Uh, well, again, Mr. Wallace, we, excuse me if I may interrupt you. Uh, yes. We've been peppering you, but you're yeah. you're well into your rebuttal time, and I, I oh. want to give you some time for <laughs> rebuttal. But please, <laughs> time. I'll try to wrap up Judge Kuzam's that, question. That's oh, okay. an example of uh, how time flies when you're having fun, right? Um, <laughs> so um, I, I do want to mention a couple of cases then, and then I'll and then I'll close. Um, you know, the Alexander case. We believe addresses that that um, uh, the Alexander case, which happens to have been cited in the Wagner case, does address uh, that ability to pay um, or pay. He does not. The, the statute does not require either ability to pay or payment in order to accept a demand for judgment. We think that's comparable to our situation. And I would also direct the court's attention back to the Economides case, which which addressed the uncertainty on the part of the offeree. Um, as to whether or not the offeror will pay does not render a proposal unenforceable or, un or ambiguous or illusory because, because the, the court has continuing jurisdiction to enforce. And the continuing jurisdiction to enforce is what we talked about with Jacqueline, which is the entry of a judgment. Um, I, of course, I'm not going to get to the, 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 the tipsy coachman issues um, that a portman would accept that a portman is not required because uh, Joanne was the sole defendant in the 2015 case, and and nor in the non-monetary condition of dismissing the Gladdings did not render the proposals invalid because it was not ambiguous. And with that, I'll I'll close unless there are any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Thank um, you. We'll, we'll give you four minutes on rebuttal. Is that okay? That is absolutely fine, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Garcia. 
Good morning. May it please the court. Martin Garcia with the Garcia Dell Law Firm in Sarasota. Uh, and I represent uh, the, uh, John DeRosier, David DeRosier, and Caroline Daher, who, and I also represent them on, at the trial below that Judge Kazam, uh, I did not do the appeal. Mr. Brannick, as you know, did that appeal. Yes, sir. Um, but uh, we do know that, that you were part of that. Um, let me first kind of jump right to the questions that you peppered Mr. Wallace with uh, for a good portion of his argument. And that deals with the standing issue. Uh, as the court is aware, we had filed a motion to dismiss based on standing. The court denied without prejudice and said, let's address it in the briefs, which is what we did. The problem that they have with respect to standing, and Mr. Wallace just highlighted it, funny enough, when he talked about his tipsy coachman issue, and that is the Gladdings were not parties to the 2015 case. And the proposal that was at issue here was in the 2015 case. And it doesn't matter that they were styled in a certain way because the One Beacon case, Judge Smith, as you pointed out, makes clear that doesn't matter. They still retain their separate identity. So what we have here is a situation that we have to evaluate based on the cases from the second district. And we had cited in a supplemental authority a case, Judge Smith, you were on the panel on back at the end of October. I think that was a true supplemental authority because it came in, I think, six days before the prior oral argument was to be had in that case. But it dealt with whether a party has standing on appeal. That was the Balch versus Bank of uh, New York Mellon. It's now at 351 Southern 3rd, 114. But what that case made clear was that you have to be, either be, you have to be a party, you have to be injured by the action that's at issue here. And what, what, what is the actions at issue? And that's the denial of the motion for attorney's fees to Joanne DeRosier. The other case that we've cited that we think really applies um, is the Trans Health Management versus Nunziato case, the 159 Southern 3rd 850. Because in that case, and it really is the standard that, that we think I was on all fours here as to why the Gladdings don't have standing to appeal an order entered with respect to the 2015 case on a proposal for settlements, proposals for settlements, because there were multiple proposals made by Joanne DeRosiers to my individual clients. And what the Kate, the court, this court said in the trans health case. And that was a, a situation where you had a judgment entered, the judgment debtor appeal, but then the other parties, the other defendants all sought to appeal as well. And this court said, well, you don't have standing other debtor, uh, other defendants because the judgment is not entered against you. Okay? And what the court made clear and says to have standing, a party must demonstrate a direct and articulable interest in the controversy and a legal cognizable interest that would be affected by the outcome of the litigation. The interest cannot be conjectural or merely hypothetical. Mr. With all Garcia, respect, it, it, yes, as I asked Mr. Wallace, help, uh, help me with my confusion. So she files proposals in the 2019 case. No, she files in 20, she files proposals in the 2015 case. Right, right. And right. does she file another set in the 2019 cases? Well, that's where that's that is the confusion, and it's the it's yes. the years. Um, you have a 2015 case that is four plaintiffs, my clients and Jacqueline Russell, against Joanne DeRosier solely. Okay? Right. Then you have a 2019 case. What makes this strange is prior to the 2019 case being filed against the Gladdings, 2019 proposals are made in the 2015 case. I understand. Those were considered by Judge Hayworth because the defendants moved for fees on that. They're not appealing his denial on that. Right. Okay. In 2020, in both the 2019 and the 2015 cases, proposals are made. In the 2015 case, in 2020, they make proposals. Joanne makes proposals for someone, which are the ones at issue here. Understood. Okay. There were also proposals made in 2020 in the 2019 case by the Gladdings. 
And that's if you saw the very start of Judge Hayworth's order where he addresses that issue. One, they didn't attach those proposals to the motion. At the hearing we had on that, I had raised that as an issue is they hadn't filed the gladdings because they were saying, well, we're entitled to, to fees for the 2019 case. Um, and Judge Hayward said, no, you didn't attach it. And even at that hearing, Mr. Bentley said, we're not arguing those. We're not claiming any entitlement to fees under those. That's, that's really a non-issue. And that's, okay. uh, but, but the order that Judge Hayworth entered did deny the Gladding's motion for attorney's fees with respect to the 2019 case and their 2020 proposals. Okay, that, that helps Mr. Garcia. Thank okay, you. okay. And, and the, the problem is we had too many 2019 proposals, 2020, we, had, we understand that that caused some confusion. Um, the, what's important, let me go back to the Nunzio case, the Trans Health. What the court also said there is the controversy that you have to look at is whether you have an interest in the controversy is not the entire case. Okay? It's the specific action contemplated by the notice or motion at issue. So the notice, the motion that's at issue here is the denial of Joanne DeRosier's request for fees. And the Gladdings don't have an interest in that for two reasons. One, if you go back to the case that Judge Smith was on the panel on recently, they weren't a party to that proceeding. Mr. Wallace just again acknowledged that. They weren't even a party to that proceeding. But more importantly, and, and this panel hit on that, that issue, and that is they didn't, they don't have a justicial issue. There's no injury to the Gladdings with respect to the denial of that motion for attorney's fees. If they were appealing in this appeal, the denial of their motion for attorney's fees, which I kept waiting in their initial brief to say that's what they would at least make that argument. They didn't even make that argument. Their entire appeal here is premised on trying to carry Joanne DeRosier's bucket with respect to that. And this court has, in these two instances and other cases, said we will not allow that to happen. You do not have standing to bring the appeal and for that reason, we respectfully request, as we did in our motion to dismiss, that the appeal be dismissed. Now, you all don't agree with me on that. I do have to address the other issues, obviously. Um, and, and Judge Kazam, you really hit the nail on the head with respect to the evaluation that Judge Hayworth did here. And Judge Hayworth, and obviously Judge Kazam, you remember Judge Hayworth's order. It was a very initial order in the underlying case. It was a very detailed order why he went through that and the basis for his ruling in that case. So Judge Hayworth knew this case intimately. And so when these proposals for settlement for enforcement are presented, and what's important about this is it wasn't just, and it wasn't a plaintiff. And this is a distinction that, I, that with all due respect to Ms. Wallace, they're not, they're not grasping. And that is if a plaintiff makes a proposal to a defendant and the defendant doesn't have the ability to pay, right? well, that's the risk you take as a, as a plaintiff that they may accept that proposal and by the way, have fun trying to collect it. But here what they did, and this is what Judge Hayworth recognized because his final order in this case, and I don't think there's any other way, say, other way to say it, comes off the top ropes on how he viewed these proposals for settlement. He called them illusory. He basically said they were disingenuous. And the reason why is everyone knew, everyone knew when these were made in February of 2020, that these numbers that were being thrown out, that Joanne DeRosiers had no ability to pay. And why is that important, specifically important here? Because the terms of the proposal were, I will pay you this amount, right? There's been arguments made, well, there are demands for, for, uh, for judgment. Well, this wasn't a demand for judgment. This was a proposal settlement that says, I will pay you these amounts. And what, as Judge Kazam, you point out, when Jacqueline accepted her, and I didn't represent Jacqueline at that point, she was unrepresented. So she accepted it. Right? She didn't get what she actually accepted. She decided to go forward and get a judgment. Okay? But that condition in terms of payment wasn't met. Arguably, she could have said, I don't want the judgment. I want to be back in the case. Because why? 
you didn't comply with the terms of your proposal. She decided to get a judgment in the cases that Mr. Wallace cites to says, you can go ahead and, and, and get a judgment on that. But I think the primary distinction in, in the cases that they've cited is as a plaintiff, if I want to make an offer for an amount that I know the defendant can't pay, right? I take that risk. But here it was a different situation. It was, it was a setup. And Judge Hayworth recognized it because what they wanted to do was for us to get a judgment. They had no intention of paying it. Get a judgment against a defendant who has no assets that everyone knew at the time had no assets. Oh, oh, by the way, the person that we transfer, or the two individuals who we transferred all of our funds to, you have to dismiss them. The claims against them are all gone. Okay? And what Judge Hayworth is, he saw through that. Okay. And he understood. He, he is, and, Judge, Judge Hayworth is, I guess he's correct. There, there's there's no animal like this in the case law. That that is correct. I, I would say, you're notwithstanding what the what the well, we're, respond said. to Mr. Wallace's point. Am I going to get into a point to a situation where I'm going to do endless discovery, not only on a person's intent but a person's financial wherewithal? No, Your Honor. Add another layer of confusion to offers and proposals of judgment. Judge Judge Hayworth, I think, contemplated that and understood that that possibility. And that's why he puts in his order from the evidence that was presented at trial as part of the underlying case that became it, it was clear. So that, that this is not a open the Pandora's box issue. It's under and this, you know, in the Fox case from the fourth DCA that talks about what a judge's role, a trial court's role is with respect to the good faith analysis. Judge Hayworth did exactly what the fourth district and Fox said you're supposed to do is analyze the entire case, analyze the circumstances of the case. That doesn't mean you go beyond and ask for discovery with respect to someone's ability to pay. And, and it's it, an interesting, Mr. Garcia, didn't at the hearing, and I read that a while ago, didn't Judge Hayward ask the lawyers, did Joanne divest all of her assets? And both sides said, yes. And there was like, it was undisputed, it was unequivocal. And Judge Hayward asked specifically that question. Correct, Your Honor. And I think that way that came up is he first asked Mr. Bentley during Mr. Bentley's argument about it, and then asked me when I was making my argument, he asked me to confirm that. And Judge Hayworth knew it. But Mr. Bentley, who uh, Mr. Wallace's partner, came out and said she had divested herself of all of her net worth by that point in time. No dispute. So we're in a situation where the, the offer is accepted or the proposal is accepted. Lo and behold, you get a judgment, and then we're going to start doing supplementary proceedings and then trying to figure out whether these were fraudulent transfers. I mean, there, there's, you know, there, there's, there's some merit to Mr. Wallace's point about the Pandora's box. And it's much easier, well, it seems, to have a well, test where I'm just... I'm just weighing the amount of the offer relative to the type of case and the, the risk of liability. The fact, though, and, and it and it would become an issue um, on a, on a demand or proposal. But, but it, when somebody okay, says at the very outset, "I didn't have the ability to pay," we don't have to go down that path. And I think that's what Judge Hayworth recognized. This was a unique situation. So to say, uh, you know, it's going to create some kind of precedent. I don't think that's the case. I think any judge can evaluate at the time. The judge says, I don't want to know what that is. And it might depend on the amount of the offer. The well, if I pick here. up on something Judge Kuzam said, I'm, I'm really slicing the salami thin, but my focus would not be on the ability to pay under these facts. My focus would have to be on her intent. If is that is what I'm going to need to your do? Honor. But also, I think it's important here that it's tied to the dismissal of the claims against the people who actually have the money, okay? which is where, and, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get into it today. The tips of coachman, we brief that issue with respect to, we don't think you ever have to go there. Um, but it's really that same issue. It's, it's the, it's the intent here was not to settle. Okay? And that is pay money. The intent was, and this is what Judge Hayworth thought is, to Get you to try to, like Jacqueline, agree to entry of a judgment for a lesser amount than you were claiming. Okay. okay. That you can't collect. That 
I know you can't collect. Oh, and by the way, there's one caveat to that. The people who actually have the money, you can't collect against them either. Okay? That does not, and that's the intent to settle. And it is to put an end to litigation. This does not put an end. Even the preceding supplemental, Judge LaRose, it doesn't put an end to the litigation. That's not no. the purpose behind a proposal for settlement. It truly is to bring a case to an end. And that was never the intent here. It's funny because the one person who did accept, her case is still ongoing. She, she has a judgment that's uncollectible. Um, and so why I, we appreciate the, the concern of, is this a slippery slope? And I would suggest to you the way this was framed and the analysis that Judge Hayworth did and noting that this was a particular case, a unique case, he even called it, okay? And, and the way the evidence or what the case was about, which Judge Kazam knows the underlying case was about and involved the transfer of all those assets. Problem is the Gladdings weren't a party and I got involved in 2019 and, and filed the lawsuit against them as well. But we don't believe that there should be a concern of this slippery slope. If you get, if the Gladdings have the right to challenge this, that you have to get to that slippery slope issue here because of the way this was framed and because of the powers given to a trial court to evaluate the entire case, which is what the Fox case says you're supposed to do. So if there are no other, I, that's basically the arguments I, 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 could, I could read from Judge uh, Hayworth's ruling on, on what he found on that, but that's all before you and I, I don't wanna waste the courts and the panel's time on that. Um, but if there are no other questions, I am, I've concluded my argument. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Wallace, rebuttal. Yes, I'll, I'll make a, a few points and it might not even take my four minutes. Uh, first about the Ball case, which is the uh, supplemental case. Um, that party was, that in, I said party, but it wasn't a party. That individual was a total stranger to the case, um, had, had an opportunity to try to intervene, chose not to below. Um, was not part of the final judgment. I don't think that's comparable to our situation. Um, the main point here remains that if the court rules that a party's ability to pay uh, is a valid consideration, uh, to my knowledge, there are no cases right now that say that. Um, and, and, you know, I've used the phrase Pandora's box. I'll come back to it to complete that analysis, uh, which is that um, even though there were some unique circumstances here that caused Joanne's financial situation to be in the record at trial, if that is a valid consideration, it's a valid consideration for everybody. Um, and if everybody gets to go um, digging into the offeror's uh, financial situation at the time of the offer, that creates um, both practical and, our, in our position, Florida constitutional right of privacy questions. Um, so we believe that that, that 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 is not a valid consideration, and it's not a valid consideration for those reasons, and never has been a valid consideration. And if it becomes a valid consideration, it creates problems. Uh, that's all I have, unless there are additional questions. Nothing. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. A, a very interesting case, and thank you for a, a, a well done argument. Thank you, Your Thank you. So you can you. exit to our virtual waiting room, and we'll call up the next case Highwoods Realty versus uh, American Integrity Insurance. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. McLaren. I see you. Mr. Calavia, I see you. Good morning to you. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. McLaren.